welcome and food for thought. I have a special guest today, Eddie Zapata. Hi. Hello. Um, we will talk about his book, The West is the Light. Eddie, could you tell us a little bit about the book you wrote? Yes. Uh, it is a coming of age story set within a historical fantasy. A young American boy, 12 years old, is given a book by his grandfather. The book is a history book about Europe from the earliest European uh, times, Stonehenge and the cave paintings of Spain, etc., down to the modern or the pre-modern era. Uh, I haven't quite decided how far, but the Napoleonic era, at least. Anyway, uh, the young boy, Clark, uh, begins looking through the book and he's intrigued by what he sees, the pictures medieval castles, Joan of Arc, pictures of uh, uh, Greek temples. And he begins to, to daydream in a way. He falls asleep on his bed. When he opens his eyes, there's a mysterious man in his room uh, volunteering to be his mentor and his guide throughout the book. So they enter the book. The, the book becomes like a, a magical portal through time. And they visit the places and the people in the book. So it's a book within a book. The book within a book. So he travels into the book during his daydream. And the book was given by his grandfather. Yes. What inspired you to write that book? Why? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I guess the answer to that question involves me and my identity. I'm an American and I was born and raised in Chicago. <clears throat> and at an early age, I uh, was introduced to, to Western uh, well, to, to European literature, high literature, Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Cervantes, <clears throat> also English poets like Wordsworth and uh, Tennyson, uh, 19th century British writers. So the, the, the European canon. But behind me on my bookshelf, you can see some examples of what I'm talking about here. And I, I fell in love with it. Uh, I, was in, I was also inspired by my mother, who is a, a very liter literate woman, that I ought to read these things and become familiar with them. So as I read these works, I didn't always understand what I was reading because I was 10 years old and it was written in, in a very high fashion, but I was intrigued. I felt like I stepped into a world of beauty. And when I compared that beauty to what I saw around me in the inner city of Chicago, working class, graffiti, rap music, I thought, well, I don't belong here. I, I, I feel more attuned to what I see in the books. And as I grew older, and as I learned more about the world, and I traveled, and I joined the military, and I met people from different backgrounds, it only reinforced my my initial contact with European culture. And I felt that uh, <clears throat> that the West is a special place, and it's also in danger of being lost, especially in the last perhaps 10 years. We've all seen this social chaos happen, certain elections, uh, questions of immigration, et cetera. I don't want to get too political. But uh, th that made me uh, decide, you know what? I hear lots of anti-Western voices coming from the West itself. We seem to be attacking ourselves. So someone has to speak on behalf of the West, who's from the West. So that's the inspiration behind the book. Interesting. Uh, and your target audience? Well, interesting question. I was asked that by, by the publisher. And I said, well, let's call it a young adult book because it, 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 it entails a young adult going on a magical journey. It has some of those aspects of like the Chronicles of Narnia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but, but some of the themes and some of the language are a bit elevated. And so <laughs> let's say it's for young adults who are rather bright <laughs> and also for adults, I hope. Mm. And so... Uh... In the in the pages that are available on Amazon, um, there was another character, uh, a black haired girl. Um, I'm curious who she is. <laughs> People have to buy the book to find out. She's a little mysterious. I don't want to give away too much information, but her name is kind of a hint. Her name is Sophia. So oh. does that does, is, does that serve as a hint for you? Wisdom wisdom it means wisdom in greek so uh some of my hints are a bit obvious so <laughs> sophia is uh <laughs> sophia is an interesting character she's um 
my main character, as I said, named Clark. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the mysterious man who appears in his room is a Scotsman named Alistair. But Alistair is under the supervision of Sophia. So she mm -hmm. is sort of like the, the supervisor of these, these sort of immortal beings who serve as mentors. And her goal, her role is sort of like a... Um, a um, what's the term I'm looking for? Her area of responsibility is Europe. I, I envision each region mm. of the world, different cultural regions, Africa, Asia, Latin America, as being under the supervision of certain groups. And those groups, the, these, these uh, almost archangel types, have responsibility for the guidance of those regions. And so Sophia is one of the, the European guiding spirits, you might say. interesting and uh she chose to come to contact with clark uh because of his ancestry uh, perhaps uh, adherence to this region or is it a secret <laughs> my diving too deep into the book <laughs> her criteria for selecting people has to do with the characteristics that each person manifests and she won't know that until someone is of a certain age and they begin to manifest certain characteristics, a certain level of intelligence, a certain curiosity about the world. But it's true, his, his lineage is European, his ancestors are European. And again, she is, she is the, the spirit, you might say, of Europe. So he would fall under her jurisdiction, so to speak. I do. I have a, a question about that. So about European ancestry, uh, is is it from your family that uh, you maybe heard stories about where you came from or like your family? Oh, uh, personally, I'm Hispanic, uh, so uh, uh, I'm Hispanic American uh, with, with roots in Mexico. Nice. So you might say indirectly, I go back to Spain, <laughs> but but through via Mexico. So I mean, I have a. a fondness for my hispanic side to my uh latin american side but that's again that, that's a separate compartment in my soul uh but i'm also an american living in the west speaking english an anglo-saxon language and i think that m many of my experiences uh many of my positive experiences and my opportunities have been shaped as a result of being a, a westerner and i'm using the word western in the broadest sense i belong mm -hmm. to western civilization the united states is uh is a creation of of the West. The, these Brits who came over here centuries ago and formulated a new country and wrote a constitution built upon European ideals of John Locke and Rousseau and Voltaire and etc. Mm -hmm. So we are the West, even though we are like Australia or like Canada. We're like children of, of Europe. Children of Europe. That's beautiful. Kind of this sense of belonging to the West. You said you were traveling. What countries in Europe have you visited? Oh, over the course of my life, I have been to Spain, England, Scotland, Ireland, Greece, Italy, and one day in Amsterdam. So I'm going to count the Netherlands. <laughs> okay. uh, any, any of those countries uh, were described in the book? Yes, um, England, but ancient, <laughs> a prehistoric England, Stonehenge. So um, I may return to England in the future, but for now, because he started at the very, very beginning, he went to uh, the the plane there on Salisbury in in, mm -hmm. in England with his guide, and uh, they visited Stonehenge when it was still used. Uh, when it's still used. And after after England, he, they go to Spain. <clears throat> but again, this is prehistoric Spain. So he goes to Altamira, that, that cave up in the north of, of Spain, where those beautiful uh, cave paintings were discovered in the mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And he has a, a, a strange mystical experience inside that cave. Wow. And you have been to that cave? No, I've been to Spain. I would love to go there. Although I understand that people are not allowed inside anymore. 
because of the contamination of, of breath and that sort of thing. But outside, there's a museum with a perfect reproduction of all of the cave paintings, which I suppose I'll have to settle for that. Interesting. Mystical experience. Do you yourself believe in the possibility that through the mystical experience, we kind of uh, can come in contact with the ancients? Or is it uh, just to inspire the sense of wonder in the young reader? Well, now is perhaps the point to mention something. Um, I am a Catholic. And just as J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings, but he did not bring Catholicism to the front. It, it, was more, it was more subtle. It was like a baked into the bread. Uh, you have to look for it. Uh, so also, my book is from a catholic perspective but it, it but again it's subtle i don't want to hit people over the head with with uh with um theology or, or with dogma but again just as c.s lewis used magic and witches but he wasn't an, a proponent of the occult or of paganism i also introduced these elements in my book with the understanding that i'm sort of i'm using it as, as a as a device but it, it's also just fun to just to just have to, to uh, allow your childish imagine childlike imagination to wander into caves and to have mystical experiences and speak to the ancestors. Th there's something uh, real about that connect connected to, to reality. I haven't seen Stonehenge, but each time I even see it on the, on the discovery channel, uh, <laughs> Like the stones up close, and I I kind of have the impression that if I were to touch them, I would get the mystical experience <laughs> right away. Just like my my, my imagination immediately uh, goes into uh, into the the world. What it was like to see the solstice uh, being in the middle of the circle. Let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky enough in 2019 to to travel there, and I I was at Stonehenge. And as far as touching it, you can't because there's there's barriers. But uh, the, the main impression that I got was that there was a, just like a, a thickness. It, it, they look like big, thick, fat thumbs sticking out of the the earth, and and they're, they're covered with greenish moss. And the impression to see them right there, like this big swollen thumb, was was, was quite different from the pictures. It was, it was very beautiful. And the field around the stones had these little white uh, daisies growing up. It's just, it's a beautiful area. Um, and uh, have you felt some sense of wonder while being there? Like this, this like nearing the ancient sites? Well, I often, I, I mean, I seek those experiences my whole life. I've, I've been to the jungles of Guatemala and I've climbed the pyramids built by the Maya, by the Mayans. And again, it's always this sort of my inner Indiana Jones, uh, although he was a skeptic. So maybe that's a bad example, mm -hmm. but my, a, a desire to, uh, to, to either touch something or to be in the, in the vicinity of something built by an ancient civilization who saw the world through a completely different worldview and to feel some, to, to attempt to connect in some you know romantic way. So yeah, I, I guess you could say I felt that there too. Would you say your book is uh, appreciation for those uh, ancient monuments that are left for us to wonder, basically? Yes, certainly. It's an appreciation for for the, those civilizations. Um, that that that's a big part of it. Well, it, it's a love letter from me. To European civilization, and and that's part of it. When when people say European civilization, I feel it sometimes they have a more constricted meaning than, than I do. For me, it goes all the way back even before the Indo-Europeans, to the Cyclopean uh, structures of uh, Crete, to the uh, mysterious civilizations on Malta, and you know, the, and of course Stonehenge too, and the cave painters of Spain. That goes back what fifteen thousand, eighteen thousand years. There were no Indo-Europeans back then. It was we don't know who they were. We give them names, but it's all kind of uh, nebulous. So I'm talking about all of Europe, because I feel that geography shapes people. And when the Indo-Europeans came, who are the most 
perhaps direct ancestors of today's Europeans. Some people may argue with that point. They they were entering into an area that was already populated by by old. They, they built upon foundations, and so all of that is part of the ingredients, part of the cauldron of, of the modern European psyche, at least in my opinion. Are there any interesting places in the U.S. that you haven't visited yet? Have not yet visited. Yes, like <laughs> yeah, many, like, I mean. like the Devil's Tower, for example. Like I I want to see that one. Which one? Devil's Tower. Oh, no. It's so funny because I live not far from there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your connection to that is, but I saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind when I was a child. This UFO movie, Steven Spielberg. I, I, and I'm sh I, I've seen it. I've seen it like oh, the seen, Okay. <laughs> okay that, that's, my mind went straight to there when you said Devil's Tower. Mm -hmm. And ever since that I one. saw that, I'm like, oh, I'd love to go there and see if I can feel the UFOs or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, uh, the short answer is no. But it's 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 north of me. It's a few hours drive. <laughs> yeah. So, why not? <laughs> uh, I, I, the reason why I'm asking, it's um, on one side there is a uh, love and appreciation for the uh, for the Europe, uh, but I actually coming from from here from Europe. I kind of like constantly look um, at, at the places in America that I would like to see. Mm. Uh, like I definitely uh, Devil's Tower. Uh, I also would love to see um, Machu Picchu. Love it. Oh, I've, I've wanted to see like, like climb uh, like all of those stairs and to touch those uh, giant blocks of stone that's so, what are, oh, like it's interesting like i keep thinking of touching a stone that's funny no that, that, if that's i will weird. get <laughs> that's very human i also if i see a big block of stone i just want to touch it even if i'm in the forest walking around and i see a big rock i'm like oh let me go touch that rock so i think that's just something that's in our spiritual dna <laughs> <laughs> like touching the ancestors eddie I yes. have a request for you from a friend of mine. Charlotte. She asked uh, if you could possibly uh, read a bit from your book. And by the way, if you have the book, please show it. So here's the book. The West very is nice. the Light. And it's a very nice bit of artwork that the publishing company did for me there. And there's my young boy reading his book on his bed. Full of wonder. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a little background. Um, the book that uh, his grandfather gave him is is a kind of transportation vehicle through time, but it also has other properties too. If you hold the book in your hands when you're at a place and you and you pose a mental question to the book, you receive a kind of inner response. So it's all like an oracle in a way. But the answer comes in a kind of flash of intuition. And I'm trying to navig navigate. I'm trying to get to that part of the book exactly to show you exactly what it was that he that he saw. So they're walking towards the stones right now. As they draw closer, Clark notices some of the stones wearing patches of green, like moss on trees. The patches confer a fuzziness upon the stones that seem queer. The megaliths also bulge with a girth more noticeable when standing in front of them than when seen in photographs. There are no guardrails or informational stations in sight, but as before, Clark thinks it better not to ask questions. Standing in front of a slab, facing east, Alistair says to Clark, <laughs> I'm not brave enough to do his Scottish accent yet, maybe one day, but for now I'll just read it in my accent. Um, <laughs> now I want you to listen to me. That book you're holding there, it's more than our transportation. It's also a means of communication. Now that we're standing here in front of Stonehenge, I want you to find the section of your book that deals with this place. Open to it and let me know when you find it. Clark dutifully does as he is asked. He consults the table of contents, finds a chapter titled Beginnings, and flips to the page indicated. There's a two-page spread showing the very location they are at now, with some text at the top in bold and smaller text at the bottom. Clark was about to tell Alistair he had found it, as he is eager to find out what was meant by means of communication, when he notices something odd about the picture. There are two individuals standing in front of the Cyclopean stones. At first, Clark thinks little of it, but as he focuses on them, he realizes with mounting amazement 
that both he and Alistair are in the book. Well, are you there yet? Yeah, but, but what's the matter, Clark? Alistair, look, we're in the book. See, that's us standing in front of Stonehenge, just like we're doing now. Alistair looks down at the boy with a glowing smile. And why shouldn't we be in your book, since this is your story? And as I am your traveling companion, I will appear from time to time also. My story? Yes, your story. Isn't that what you wished for? To enter the world of the book and meet the people you found there and have adventures? Well, here you are, Clark, at the beginning of your story. I'm going to pause right there. Um, so they're at Stonehenge, but the, he hasn't interacted yet with the stones. But that's just some background, and that's what the book does, and that's who Alistair is. So I'm just going to pause there because I don't want to go on and on and on. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, before we finish up here, I would like you to tell us where can people buy your book? How can they support you? And uh, if possibly reach out to you for like uh, an interview or a commentary. Uh, www.aristosbooks.com. That's the imprint, uh, Aristos Books. And that takes you to my website, which has links to the book. But also you can just uh, go to amazon.com uh, and look up The West is the Light and my name, Eddie Zapata. And it will take you there. Uh, but I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I put links on my website for a discounted version of the book directly from the distributor. So get it for a cheaper price on my website. Yeah, there you go, people. Please support Eddie and uh, read his book. Thank you so much. And... Tara, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, see you in the next episode. Bye, people. When I look at the moon, I'm thinking, okay, ancestors before me looked at the moon. Right. And, like, and there is like this weird feeling of being drawn into the moon. Like it's, it's it's strange, but like just for a few seconds, I'm like, oh, like, whoa, what was that? The moon is one of my favorite features in all of nature. Whenever I walk outside and there she is, the full moon, no clouds. And you can see that sort of a, a radiance around it. And there's like the blackness of space. Mm -hmm. Then there's a, an aura, uh, like a corona, whatever it's called. And then there's the moon. Yeah. I could just stare at it. I, I call it her because to me, she's a, she's a her. I could just stare at her and stare at her and, st and never get bored. I, I love the moon. <laughs>